And um, I can speak really loud, so I'm sure everybody can hear me. But if uh, they can't, raise their hand. Uh, my name is Franny Laundrin, and I'm the director of Greater Falls Connections. Greater Falls Connections has been in this community about seven years. It used to be called Greater Falls Prevention Coalition. And uh, same purpose of trying to create a healthy, happy, drug-free community for our youth and families. So I have, I have a short presentation, and then I'm going to hand things over to our wonderful uh, moderator and panelists. And um, I usually try on these kinds of things not to be too text heavy, but I'm afraid I was a little more text heavy than I like, but so be it. Here we go. So why are we here tonight? It's, it's in the news. And what is in the news? Is it positive? Is it negative? How can we impact what's in the news? What does it look like in Vermont and in our community? What are the challenges facing our community? And what can we um, do to strategize? How can we all work together? So what are we? We're a coalition. And a coalition means it's not just for staff people who happen to have jobs in the office, but it's a group of people, groups, organizations who join together for a common purpose. So that's why we're so pleased to see it's such a diverse group of people here today. Um, prevention uh, is our focus. Um, and it's the promotion of constructive lifestyles and norms that discourage drug use. These are commonly accepted terms around the country. And it's an ongoing process that um, relates and must relate to emerging and changing things in generations as they come along. So one of the things, one of the words that we use a lot are words are risk and protective factors. These things can affect children at different stages of their lives and, and transitional stages in particular. So these are just some examples of what they talk about. If you're looking at it in individual, early aggressive behavior is a risk factor. Having good impulse control is a protective factor. A risk factor is actually having substance abuse amongst their peers. A protective factor is academic competence. So they sort of try to balance each other out and try to make sure that we're uh, providing the best opportunities for our youth along those stages. I'm flipping here. So what are we talking about? It's in the news. Um, I'm not sure how much everybody has seen um, what's in the news and in various formats in the news, but it's a lot out there. And it's changed over time. So I've got a few, uh, over the years, back in the 1800s, direct marketing of heroin, right there. <coughs> cocaine tooth drops for your little baby so that they don't cry so much. <laughs> and then most recently from the Rolling Stone, uh, February this year's magazine, the state of Vermont, pure heroin, and a whole article about it. So we're not just getting, it's not just what's in our local news or in our state news, but it's uh, happening sort of nationally and changing uh, people's perceptions of what Vermont is and what we're trying to make it to be. Some important little facts are 77% um, of addicts say that they started by using an FDA approved painkiller like Oxycontin. And there are only, another interesting fact, there are only two countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer marketing, the U.S. and New Zealand. All of those pharmaceutical ads we see on TV, we hear on the radio with the really fast-speaking, incredibly long list of um, side effects that, could, that you should watch out for, we are the only place that does that. So it went from a few cases in the early 80s to a $4.5 billion industry in 2009. And it's done a lot. It's created a consumer model of health information and empowered people to self-medicate. And some of the people who are out there speaking about this problem um, from around are, I'm sure everybody heard, Governor Shumlin in his state of the state, just an abbreviated section, 
says, what started as an Oxycontin and prescription drug addiction problem in Vermont has now grown into a full-blown heroin crisis. It, it requires all of us to take action before the quality of life that we cherish so much is compromised. Senator Patrick Leahy had held a judicial hearing here in Vermont um, in March, <coughs> specifically around the op opioid issue. And he said, we have to get ahead of addiction. We can't let it corrode our lives and our communities. You can't arrest your way out of this. Prevention, education, treatment, and law enforcement must all work together. Once again, why we have a great diverse panel here. And these are messages from people that have a lot of influence. Um, I'm sure people heard back in February about Philip, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And this is one of the most powerful snippets of news that I heard, so it affected me deeply, so I like to share it. Philip Hoffman, this kind, decent, magnificent, thunderous actor, did not die from an overdose of heroin. <coughs> he died from heroin. We should stop implying that if he'd just taken the proper amount, then everything would have been fine. He didn't die because he was partying too hard or because he was depressed. He died because he was an addict on a day of the week with a Y in it. And that was written by Aaron Sorkin, um, creator of The West Wing and other TV shows, who was also um, an addict. <coughs> um, so last December, on, on the sort of upside, we gave you all the sort of facts and stuff, and before we hear the perspectives of our, our panelists, is last December we had a, a, goal, uh, a gathering at our coalition. And we had a bunch of kids from the Boys and Girls Club there, and we asked them to fill out a little um, cards that were decorations for our Christmas tree with their dreams. And these are just some of the ones that they had that we thought were great. Everything from to help the homeless to find homes, prosperity for our community, to marry my boyfriend, stop cutting, having a skateboard park, to have a ha happy and healthy community. Somebody has a dream job, they want to be an FBI agent and they want to figure out how to do that. That we all smile, laugh, and share together. That no one fights to be happy, that no child be hungry, and that all children will be safe and have a family. So at this point, I'm going to pass things over to our moderator, Mike Smith. Let me do his little bio, and then he can introduce the panel. And many of you, I'm sure, know Mike Smith. He's the administrator at Greater Rockingham Area Services. He and his wife Susan moved here from Texas. That's quite a big in 1981 to build a house and raise their children. He's worked for HCRS and the Brattleboro Retreat, and he works for Greater Rockingham Area Services and Administrator of the Health Center at Bellas Falls. He's a member of the Rotary and serves on the board of the Chamber of Commerce and FACT TV. So thank you, Mike, for volunteering your time. We have a lot of work to do tonight. We have two hours and we have a full agenda. We're going to have a panel discussion here in a little bit. One of the things I just wanted to say was, I, as I see this issue and I see the action we need to take, if we all remember when Irene hit two years ago and there was all the destruction and everybody came out and helped everybody else. This is Irene, again, except it's pernicious, it's invisible, there aren't buildings that are being destroyed, it's people's lives, families, and communities are being destroyed by this issue. And we really need to come together and act in the same manner we acted at that time. There was no blaming people about, well, who made this Irene happen? People got together and started fixing things. And that's what we need to think about tonight, and I hope we'll take that orientation tonight. I'd like you to ask people to turn off their cell phones so that we can hear. Mm -hmm. And then if you have questions, which we're going to be taking questions from the audience, speak up. We have Fact TV here. And I know one of the most important things that we have in Fact TV is sound. If you can't hear the question, it doesn't, you know, people just don't respond. And uh, so we're going to start. Our agenda tonight is we've done our welcomes. What we're going to do is try to orient yourself as to where we are right now today with this problem. And we want to look at it from a different perspective. So we want to look at, Amelia's going to do the medical perspective, Shane's going to do the law enforcement perspective, 
Uh, Jim is going to do like the treatment, uh, medical community perspective, and Heidi is going to look at it from a recovery perspective. So I'll do a little bit more orientation or yeah, introduction with them in a bit, but they'll do their panel discussion and sort of tell you where, where they see what's happening. Then we're going to open it up for, to questions from you. So as uh, we have some people here, they're going to pass out cards so that as we're going through their discussions, you can write down questions. And then what we'll do is we'll gather all the questions together. And again, in the, in the interest of being able to everyone hear the question, I'll read the question out, and then the panel members will answer it. So we're going to do that for about the first hour. And then what we're going to do is brainstorm ideas and solutions that we can do in the community and form teams to be able to do that. Now we are second hour. So anybody have any questions about that? The bathrooms are off out into the right. There's water out there. There's water in the back. Uh, feel free if you need to get up and, and um, you know use the bathroom or get a drink or do something. Feel free to do that. So our panel. We're going to start with our panel. Oh wait a second. We're not going to start with our panel discussion. We're going to start with our panel. We're doing this off the cuff, so you're going to have to give me a little bit of a break. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is show a little film clip about. Um, addiction and how it affects the community and this is from a hungry heart this is from the film hungry heart which we actually screened here uh, last fall and so this is a, a short clip that we just wanted to show that it gives a perspective of the impact on our communities In the foster care for j just under three years and that I was bounced around to 22 different foster homes so just kind of just alone by myself with nobody that cared about me. When I was 10 my dad left my mother and then since then you know I mean I was looking I was all these older kids looking for like someone to look up to because my dad wasn't around. Uh, I don't, I don't speak to my father. He's, he's not my father. I don't, I don't have a father. My dad will be gone. I think the person in the My mom and my father drink every day. Every day. As far as, you know, a parent type figure in my life, I didn't have one. Definitely would have had that. I didn't have a bad life. I had a pretty good life. I grew up on a farm. I worked with my family every day. My parents treated us kids well, always there for us. When Dustin was a little boy, he was amazing. He, if you wanted the truth, it was Dustin to go to. He was always very shy, very sweet. He was like the love bug of the family. Take them all down to the barn with me, and I had a little bed down there where there was hay set up, and they'd fall asleep in the hay, and about six, seven o'clock, he'd start seeing them pop up, and Dustin, he was usually the first one up ready to do his chores. When I first started noticing it with Dustin is um, family functions. We always do a lot with family, and he was never around. I always had some place to go or something to do. I might stop into the family event for an hour just to say hi and show my face, then go hang out with my buddies and get hot. I couldn't keep him in the barn more than an hour at a time, and then he wasn't answering phones, and that's when I said to my husband, something's wrong. He sold his skidoo, he sold his bow, just things that meant a lot to him meant absolutely nothing to him. I started stealing whatever it took to get money. I needed money, I needed to feed my habit. My parents own a bunch of farms, they got all this junk metal. The little things that mean nothing to them, but to me, I look and see dollar signs. I like this thing right here, it ain't worth much. 
you probably get 100 bucks for it and it'd take you days work to cut it up and everything so it really ain't worth it but you got a hundred dollars in your pocket you can get high for a day and then my husband had just bought a roll of copper wire and he noticed the copper wire was gone but it wasn't dustin it wasn't dustin doing this well when i took the copper right where that shed is right there and it was sitting in there a roll of it a piece of junk metal 100 pounds of it would be five ten bucks or whatever and copper 100 pounds of it would be 200 or better my husband has this thing with tools if he sees a good deal on a tool he'll buy it and we'd stick it in storage stick it in the attic until needed and he needed something one day and the tools were gone it was about twenty thousand dollars worth of tools now so again, this is just a really short snippet of the film, A Hungry Heart. Uh, we're actually going to be um, screening that film through FACT TV uh, in, the next, uh, few, in the next month or so, so be looking forward to that. Okay, and now while Chad breaks this down, um, we're going to introduce our panel. Amelia Schillingford, she's a uh, nurse practitioner here at the uh, Health Center in Dallas Falls. She works at the Rockingham Medical Group. Um, she's a Harvard graduate and, oh, Yale graduate. I really messed up. <laughs> I, can just, I have to leave now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think it was one of those really, you know, what's in Dallas Falls High? Um, anyway. Lieutenant Shane Harris is our uh, lieutenant for our police force here. He served in the Vermont Drug Task Force, was uh, chief of police in, in, in Chester, and is back with us now. Uh, Jim Welsh is a psych, well, I knew him as a psych nurse, psych nurse, not mm -hmm. practitioner, right? But, um, and worked at the Women's Center, and now works in Springfield with uh, substance abuse treatment and addiction. And Heidi Merck Melcher is from Turning Point. It's, um, a recovery center for the Los Angeles Springfield, Vermont, and I is the recovery coach coordinator. Thank you. So we're going to begin with Amelia and go from there. So All right. How much time do I have? About five minutes. About five five minutes. minutes. All right. So I'm going to timey because I talk too long. I will. You know? I will be the. I will right. be that timekeeper. Right. Give him a bell. Can you hear me? Okay. No, you can't. Here, can't see. Can't see me. Yeah. Okay. Push back. Um, so I've been here two and a half years. I moved from just outside of Boston. I live in town. Um, I wanted to come to a Vermont town where I could live and work in the community. I actually live right over on South Street and I have loved living here. I work with Jim. I have an office um, providing primary care up at the top of Red Light Hill. Um, we're affiliated with Springfield Hospital. I work with um, Gary Clay and John Letman and Dr. Hall. And I do both uh, walking care as well as manage my own panel of patients. Um, and you can sometimes see me around town walking my black dog, Nico. Um, I know some of you guys in the, off, uh, in the uh, audience, and I, I want to provide information to you that you don't know already. And I imagine there's some different levels of information about what you guys know and what you don't know. Um, when I see people in the office who are affected by opiate addiction, um, I see a plethora of different folks. Um, I see people who've been robbed, people who are currently addicted, people who are using, just starting out, and family members and friends who love someone who is currently addicted and in trouble. Um, and then of course I see the people who are addicted who are interested in getting treatments and the folks who are not interested in getting treatment. So, Pretty much once or twice a day, I have someone who is still at the point in their lives where they're doing anything they can to get their drug, including telling me they have dental pain, abdominal pain, back pain, or something that is sort of a uh, fabrication that's really a, a side effect of their disease and not something that they're um, primarily seeking my counsel for. Um, everyone whom I've seen in the office who is physically dependent on heroin started out using something else first. I haven't seen anyone started out on heroin. I've seen them start out on what they talk to as perks, bikes, and they all have names. So there's a whole other sort of culture out there about um, opiates and, and how they're um, referred to. Uh, and eventually almost everyone becomes uh, 
everyone I've seen who's on heroin becomes a slave to the drug. It is personality changing. And they say, I never thought I would be here. I never thought I'd be here. And I don't know what to do. My whole life is this drug. And I have people who come to me and say, my whole life is Oxycontin, Oxycodone. Um, and the thing that I think that most people know is that when we look, talk about Vicodin and Percocet and Oxycodone and Hydrocodone, they're all from the opiate poppy. Okay, so they all target the opiate receptors in our brains. Our bodies naturally make some opiates and we have receptors in our brains. That means that when we get exposed to this drug, we feel great. Power, more powerfully than other drugs out there. And we're gonna let Jim chime in if, Jim has a um, different training, but more training, so feel free to contradict me if I say Doing something that great. doesn't make sense. Keep going. Um, <laughs> So uh, it's an incredibly strong uh, reaction, and it's incredibly beneficial. There are times when opiates um, can really uh, perform miracles. My mother had stage four cancer, and she was able to stay at home, and I was able to take care of her because she was able to get daily, daily opiate prescriptions from her doctor because she was dying of cancer. And that kept her out of the hospital, and that helped manage her pain. But we have become very we had been told by the pharmaceutical industry, um, Purdue Pharmaceuticals in the early 90s was given FDA approval to take uh, a Percocet pill, which is oxycodone, and combine it into a 12, 8 to 12 hour release pill called Oxycontin, which took four to six times the regular dosage and put it in one little pill. One minute. And there were people who said we have now legalized heroin in pill form. And so, and since they also said, you medical prescribers, for your, your whole career you've been told that opiates are highly addictive and you've been told you should not prescribe them for people who have chronic pain, from back pain or shoulder pain or whatever. This medicine is safe. There are fewer risks of dependency and abuse. You should prescribe this medicine. There were informative videos, you can look them up online, with doctors advertising this medicine. So it started to become everywhere. We started to treat chronic pain. There was a, a pain society that st advertised pain as the fifth vital sign. And, and patients, and we as a population now have, I deserve to have my pain treated. I deserve to have my pain treated. You do deserve to have your pain recognized and treated to the best of our ability. The pharmaceuticals answer to that was an opiate. And they told us, don't be worried, it's not that addictive. And so we had this plethora, 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 word. Uh, thank you. Proliferation, thank you, um, of opiates. And I can tell you, I have 15 minutes, of 15 minutes with patients. I don't get time to figure out what's really going on with you. It takes several visits. The easiest thing for me to do is give you a drug. So that's one of the challenges and sort of my larger perspective. And as I told you, I was going to talk for too long. <laughs> Remember to write down questions if you have questions for the panel. There are cards on the chairs. There are cards on the chairs. And we have more. And we have more. So, Shane? My name's Shane Harris. I'm a, the police lieutenant here in Bells Falls. I have lived in this community for the last 24 years. Um, <laughs> Uh, raise. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ron, I want to raise. Can you hear that? Yeah. Um, raised my family here. I have two kids, one in the middle school and one in the high school. And like you, have a vested interest in what happens in our community, specifically around the drug issue that we have. Um, I can tell you about five years ago when I went through some of the stats uh, amongst our department as well as local departments. Um, the top three drugs that we were seeing and making arrests for at that time were marijuana, uh, prescription drugs, which would be uh, a couple classes of the opiates, and then opioids, which is what uh, Amelia's talked about. Um, and then cocaine, and then marijuana. In 2012, about midsummer, heroin on a broader scale. Uh, was reintroduced. It's not like it's new in this community. It's always been here. 
um, was reintroduced to this community in a larger scale by what we commonly refer to as day trippers, which are the addicts that would travel from their own community down to source cities like Springfield, Holyoke, Mass, Hartford, Connecticut, to um, acquire heroin for themselves. When they would go down, they'd also purchase extra to bring back for people here, not necessarily as acting as a dealer, but acting in a means to help somebody else out who was sick, because sickness from the withdrawals is pretty significant with heroin. Once that started here, then we started to create a demand. In about uh, late 2012, early 2013, the price fell right out of the bottom of heroin because it, there was so much in the country. And it made its way up from the southern states up into New England, namely in Boston. So instead of paying two to $300 for a bundle of heroin, because heroin would cost up to $25 to $30 for one little bag, now we're paying only $100, $80 to $100 for a bundle. So the price dropped right out. Once that happened, then the demand really grew. In 2010, between 2008 and 2009, we had four heroin arrests. That has jumped to, in 2013, where 25% of all our arrests were as a result of heroin and other opiate, opioid type drugs. That's, that's an issue. That's obviously a, a concern for us. That's a concern for you. That's a concern for anybody that wants to move this, to this community. Right now, the number one drug that we're seeing as a result of our arrests and contact with, with people is heroin, followed by the prescription drugs of the opiates, opioids, with cocaine, hallucinogenic uh, synthetic drugs like the bath salts and the synthetic marijuana, which is really creating another problem, which is a totally different topic. but and then follow it up finally with uh, marijuana. Over the past five years, we've responded to nearly a dozen overdose, with two of those being uh, having a death. And I, I talked about the percentages. 8% of all our cases last year were as a result of uh, heroin and or opiates, whereas this year, we're at 26%. Some of the causes that we're finding right now um, we're thinking that with so much heroin being prevalent and being easily accessible with the cost and the fact that it's coming here, not only have you created the demand, but the supply is there. And there are, there are entities and groups that come to this community and other communities in this area to make, to make money. And there's a lot of money to be made. I'll also add up that from our perspective, we are prescribing fewer opiates now. So while the market was wash with opiate pills, there is now fewer opiate prescriptions. <coughs> and all those folks who are opiate dependent are now going to heroin because they dread getting sick and because it's cheaper. And the market has changed so that people realize that the heroin is cheaper, so people are coming to sell it. But to circle back to a more, um, to try to look at the problem in a, in a broader uh, scope, is we're arresting most of the customers or the demand as opposed to the supply. Um, the police typically don't catch the smartest of, the group usually catch what's left behind. Um, we have employed some different strategies to try to counteract that, and we're not the only agency that have tried different strategies, this is all over. Uh, New England, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we're just copying somebody else's success. And it does work, and it has worked. So those shocking numbers of the percentages of the overall arrests are not <coughs> necessarily indicative of an, a heroin epidemic here in this village. It just means that maybe some of these strategies are working in intercepting the transportation of those drugs. Some things, other things that we would like to do is utilize current tools that we have, but also current tools that are available to us. And one of the biggest ones right now is that we're in the process of a police canine for the narcotic uh, detection. Um, but drug enforcement and the chief who's here, along with the town manager, can explain to you is expensive. Because in addition to handling the normal police-related call volume, the noise complaints, the larcenies, and the assaults, you also have to handle 
the, the bigger burden of the drug issue here, which also has collateral crime that goes along with it. So it costs money to do. And some of those strategies we have started and stopped to be able to show a measured success to it. Future strategies, and Tracy Shriver, who is the prosecutor here in Wyndham County, wanted me to share. Um, there's a model out of Chittenden County that we're trying to employ here in uh, Wyndham County, which is a drug court, which takes those cases where an offender and the type of offense would fit better out of uh, the criminal court system and into a drug court where prevention and some sort of treatment is the alternative to the punitive side. So those are the things that we're working on now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jim Walsh. <clears throat> Some of you know me. I've actually, um, proud to say I've been in Vermont as long as Mike has. I think I've been here a little over 30 years. Um, about 28 years, I gotta think how old Danny is, uh, right here in Saxons River. Uh, I've had 30 years working. I did about 16 years down at the Brattleboro Retreat working with adolescents, which of course was in a large part substance abuse work with those, with the kids. Um, and then up here for Springfield Hospital since 97. Um, we worked with um, uh, the Wyndham Center, which is that everybody knows the Wyndham Center? Mm -hmm. I always think it's the best kept secret in Bell's Falls, mm -hmm. but maybe not, uh, which is a 10 bed uh, psychiatric unit right at the health center. Um, that works with folks with mental health and serious mental health issues um, and uh, was proud to be the manager there for uh, uh, 10, 12 years. I'm currently a psychiatric nurse practitioner. For much of that, both of those times, I've had the opportunity to work with the state uh, at the state level trying to coordinate some care around mental health and substance abuse functions. My current job is to kind of be the, the man on the ground in a variety of settings from the birthing center to the medical surgical and ER floors to the primary care settings and back including the Wyndham Center and including uh, treatment for opiates with uh, the MAT is the new term, medically assisted programming uh, which works with things like methadone or buprenorphine uh, also known as suboxone in its combination drug uh, to work with folks who are addicted to get a get a line on a life and a coping and a family in a way while they are being uh, subsidizing those receptors in the brain that just don't seem to be able to get off the opiate. Um, we actually, I don't know if people know this, but we have a buprenorphine group right here in Bellows Falls uh, that we are have for probably you know several years now covered, carried about 50 patients on a weekly basis on MAT treatment. Um, and throughout the Springfield system we probably have you know another uh, half a dozen to 20 patients at any given time that are getting these kind of replacement therapies. I'm on the steering committee uh, for the state um, blueprint for health um, to uh, kind of consult and to organize a larger system. We have what we call it's the Opiate uh, Alliance for Care. I think is eh, something like that, but everybody knows it as the Hub and Spoke, which is a system that was put in place. Uh, a, little over a year ago, but has set up induction centers for people who need this kind of treatment um, and need, as you might imagine, a lot of support and supervision and additional treatments while they're being induced and stabilized to these medications and has taken a lot of the uh, pressure off the local providers to um, do that first step. Um, and the plan, not like, unlike the airlines, is that you have this hub that does this level of work and then folks move out into the spokes um, and are closer to home, continuing with supportive treatment, uh, continuing with monitoring uh, as well and trying to you know, help them move past this uh, portion of their life. Um, I put a poster up in the back, thank you Anna Smith, uh, that talks about the uh, hub and spoke system if anybody's interested where those hubs are located. Um, and I'm, I'm also weakly involved, <laughs> thank you, in the um, treatment of these folks. We have um, meetings uh, at the Wyndham Center and I work, meet with the uh, primary care individual physicians who do this. This is all physician-based practice uh, for any of the MAT um, uh, replacement therapies. Um, 
and we work, uh, I'm also happen to be on the community health team, which is part of the model to bring uh, all services in the community uh, into a connected communicating network. I, I'm proud to say I, I get to work with Turning Point staff, both mm -hmm. Mike and Larry, on a regular basis. I work with HCRS, the community health, uh, the local uh, community health, health center, uh, to work with those patients. Um, and we are trying to really work on it can get more seamless for our patients because it's not just the medical treatment, it's not just the psychiatric and substance abuse treatment, it's also the socioeconomic issues that they're all facing. Uh, housing, you know, uh, food, Transportation is a huge jobs, right? As at the core of this, transportation is a huge issue in urban or rural settings like ours. Um, and we've, you know, done a, I think some of the folks have done a really remarkable job to make sure that anybody can get to any appointment, that that shouldn't be the reason. Having said that, there is a, a line at the door to get this kind of treatment. Um, and the people who walk up today and say, I want this, often, you know, are given a number. You know, uh, and are directed to you know several kind of hoops and hurdles that they have to navigate in order to get this treatment and get started with it. And that's something that I think uh, government Governor Shumrin was talking about when he was talking about trying to make this treatment more available so that we can catch people at that moment of sanity. The program refers to when people have motivation and are interested in making that change. Um, these people stay sick. Um, and continue to use, understandably, until they can find a way to get a treatment that's covering those physiological needs and they can start to stabilize with the other needs. Uh, and I'll stop there. I, I too can keep going, but I, and questions and things that you're interested in, I have some materials with me, but please feel free to poke away. Thank you. Um, I actually grew up in this area. I was born and raised in this area and I moved away to go to college and spent quite a few years away and recently moved back in uh, 2010 to be closer to my family. <coughs> um, I've been in recovery personally for 16 years and I'm on the board of directors at the Turning Point where we get about a thousand people a month coming in. It's a drop-in center where people wanting recovery, in recovery, um, to come a safe place to hang out, drug and alcohol free. Um, you know, a lot of times when people are in recovery, they're, at the beginning they're really struggling with, you know, stability, finding a job, that kind of stuff. So it's really important to have a safe place for them to be able to hang out and feel comfortable there. At the Turning Point, we offer recovery coaching which is um, a program where um, a peer, so someone else who's also in recovery, um, works with them. It sort of helps them um, develop a plan that works best for them. One of the um, philosophies of recovery coaching is that someone is in recovery when they say they are in recovery, not when someone tells them that they have to be in recovery or that they are in recovery, but when they say they are in recovery. And a recovery coach helps, uses all pathways to recovery, not just the 12-step programs, but every, every um, different program. And there are many different pathways to recovery out there. Um, so we really help them sort of develop a plan and carry through. And the biggest part of a recovery coach is to not pass judgment. We, we're not, we don't pass judgment on anything. And most of us have been there and done that. And so we, you know, we, we feel comfortable not passing judgment on what's going on. So, um, and we really just want to sort of be a cheerleader for them. But yet we ask powerful questions is what we say. We want to ask them powerful questions so that they can come up with their own answers and figure out the best way for them to be able to navigate their way through recovery. And um, I'll just stop there since. <laughs> Thanks. I would like to open, up, open it up to questions from the audience, and if anyone has written any questions down, I... You? 
I uh, heard the interventions for people who are looking for help. What kind of success do you have and how much recidivism uh, happens after they have been in treatment? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, relapse is part of the disease, mm -hmm. and part of that, I like the definition because, you know, one of the other things we say is you can't relapse if you've not recovered. You know, that the um, people do better the better they do. Uh, we have people who are in our groups for six and seven years uh, who are continuing to go to the groups and doing well. Um, I'm, have, you know, I've seen recovery. I work with a lot of people in recovery. I think if I'd be surprised if we went around the room and asked everybody, you know, who they know that has an addiction, whether it be in family or in work or around, if we had anybody who didn't raise their hand. Um, and I think that often that's the recovery you find and see. Uh, what the reality is, there's a lot of struggle in this in the stage of the illness. We talk about this in being a an illness that has stages, uh, and the stages, you know, pre-contemplative. You know, there's the ap active use when somebody's not even thinking about doing anything differently. Uh, when people start to move into being contemplative and considering what they can do, that's usually the, you know, getting dry, excuse the alcohol language, but, uh, and then, you know, slipping and getting, you know, having relapses occur. But as they can move out of that, we find as people rise above, it, it success builds success, and people stay sober. I would hate to call somebody who's had 10 years of sobriety and has a slip as somebody who hasn't been successful. You know, that still is recovery. So if you count the days of recovery, I think it can, it can actually make a case that there's more recovery than there is relapse. And I just want to, you, you know, build on what you're saying because it, it is true. Part of what we say, part of recover, recovery is relapse, and and you know just learning from it and, and starting over and, and moving forward. And um, it, it's not an easy process. It's, it's not as easy as just stopping. And I mean, a lot of times you have to rebuild your whole life from the beginning. And you know, if you, you, sometimes people don't have the tools to deal with the problems that they have at that time, so. I have a question from the audience and it's um, I'll just reckon whoever would like to go first, but are kids with ADHD and other medications more likely to abuse drugs? So sort of two questions. One, there's the diagnosis of ADHD, a, a kid who has that diagnosis, and then the, uh, a kid who is using other medications. So ADD can be treated, ADHD can be treated in multiple ways. One way it can be treated was with a stimulant medicine, like Adderall Concerta. Um, so I'm guessing there's two questions there. One, are ADD kids with that diagnosis more likely to use? And two, are kids who are treated with stimulants more likely to use? I'm going to go with that one. And I'm not going to answer it because I don't know the answer. Well, I, um, um, I know that statistic. Um, sure. General population is 20%. Yeah. Kids with ADHD, 35%. So 15% increase just by virtue of having ADD or ADHD. I am in my other, on my, with my other hat, I work in the school system. So I see this, I work with ADHD children a lot. And I think more of the issue is the social skills and the social um, skills that they sort of don't get at home or don't seem to able to grasp. That to me seems to be more of what may push them towards, um, you know, drug or alcohol abuse because they don't feel like they fit in, you know, all those other things, um, more so than perhaps they're on the medication or because they have it, but the social skills. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the protective versus at-risk kind of factors that are going on, that if someone is, you know, as you're saying, isolated or, you know, uh, picked on, having, you know, more likely to you know have dilemmas poor self-image because of these kind of things uh, it's, it does increase the risk for in general for everybody uh, whether you have ADHD or whether you're heavy or whether you have a cleft lip 
Um, but the, uh, re <clears throat> the other parts of this is really that the figuring out how you can you know, help you know, individually work with people's self-esteem, emotional intelligence, if people have heard that term, you know, the ability to navigate you know, your own emotions as well as those around you is a huge protective factor. And they find like, you know, this, is, this is kind of looking at what you can do about it. Uh, statistics are real and important and they guide us in how we make interventions and what are the ones that are worth our efforts. But having said that, there's a lot of different numbers out there. I will say, talking to one of the psychiatrists that works with us, uh, Ted Miller. Ted, right? Oh. Todd. Yeah. I always get that Theodore. Right. He loves Theodore. that. Theodore. Yeah. Um, uh, he said there is some data that suggests that adults uh, who have ADD, diagnosed as children, and who have their ADD treated, um, who are also opiate dependent, do better when you treat their ADD with a stimulant medicine. Uh, so it is possible to both have ADD be treated with a stimulant and also uh, uh, that ha not have that compromise your sobriety. There certainly is a much larger question in our society about how we treat medical conditions with drugs and whether or not those are the most effective ways to do so. Okay, thank you. Here's the next question. If someone or a family member is in need of substance abuse or addiction treatment, how can he or she get help? Uh, within, the, I can speak to that. I mean, there's a variety of ways to get help depending on, you know, where you want to go, how local you want to receive it, uh, people, and how much, you know, uh, you feel like you can struggle with developing a treatment plan. Uh, folks, people, people, you can go away for treatment, right? There's recovery in rehabilitation centers that will take people out of their environments and reestablish, you know, a period of time with them to, to clear their receptors, to detox them if necessary, or to stabilize them. Um, the places I, we suggest everybody go to is their primary care or their pediatrician. Um, Springfield Medical Care Systems has what we are calling now integrated behavioral health, um, that you have access to you know, everything we have through your primary care. Uh, if in part of that evaluation there, someone like me or one of the social workers that are now in all the individual practices determined that you know, a referral to something like the hub, you know, a day treatment program where you would commute back and forth, get, you know, take, a, take a vacation, take a week or so, and try to get some stability in a program and then maybe continue with your life while you're continuing with the treatment, um, you know, we can make that referral there. Uh, or, and, or we can move you back here. Part of the issue which shouldn't be overlooked is not everybody needs um, medically assisted treatment. Not every addict needs to be put on, that's an opiate addict has to have methadone or suboxone uh, to get well. So part of this evaluation is making a determination, uh, you know, what other supports have been tried, what other things can be put in place locally to help folks. Um, you know, we are always kind of, uh, it, medication is important and plays a role, but if we can find other ways to support treatment, we want to do that. Um, it really does seem that there are people, as we all know, who quit a lot of things with, you know, less help than they, you know, uh, would have imagined they needed um, because they have a motivation or a situation changes or there is someone there for them to supply them with the help and, you know, love, you know, for lack of a, you know, a, a fancy are, word are to do that. No. No, I think I said before that there are lines at the door for lots of these treatments. But, I, but absolutely, the fastest way we have to provide treatment is to go to your primary care. I have on a daily basis messages that I work through about I have an urgent case. Can you see this person this week? And we are successful at getting that started within a week to make that assessment, to start to make those determinations. But yeah, you may have to go stand in line. Uh, especially if you want that level of care that's not universally available yet. It's better than it was, but it's still scarce. I, I would just like to add that um, in terms of recovery coaching, um, that's free right. for anyone who wants it. You just have to go to the turning point or, or call and, and it's free and you'll get set up. And you don't necessarily have to be stopped using but like I said, if you have that desire, okay. if you want to stop, you can start with you know recovery coaching to sort of talk you through it until perhaps maybe you can get right. into and one of the other places. And five days a week, HCRS has walk-in hours. 
uh, between Bellows Falls and Springfield that if folks are looking to stop and talk to somebody on any business day anyway, there's a place to just walk in without an appointment and start that process. Do you think okay. for a heroin addict, the Turning Point Recovery Center works? I mean, if you're a full-blown <coughs> heroin addict, is well, that going to help them to come to your recovery center? Well, um, yes. Yes. It would help them. It would help them, but you know, in terms of like hanging out there, no, because we don't allow active use to go on there. But um, in terms of working with a recovery coach, you know, even if that's just, just, just to start to get yeah. them going, then yes. Yes. And I've had patients who have gone to turning yeah. points like that. They are they are not quite ready to go to the next level, or they're waiting. But they'll come in and talk to. They actually have a designated mat counselor now, mm -hmm. uh, medically assisted treatment again, who will talk to the opiate folks and try to help them understand the system and figure out where that contemplation is and try to get them you know into a slot someplace as quick as they are ready I just need to yeah, that. Okay. this is i'm going a little out of order but where is turning point the question is where is turning point located and what about bf residents how do they get there and how, how would they get involved okay i actually put some um of our uh, brochures on the back table back there that has all of our information but we are located on morgan street in springfield which if you're going into town, it's the Springfield Health Center, the new Springfield Health Center, we're right behind it. And actually, we have a big, huge mm -hmm. sign on it that says Turning Point. Right. And we also have a transition house there, which is people who, it's, it's not a halfway house, but people who are coming out of recovery who sort of need a little place to stay. So we have that there as well. And BF, I don't know, do we have something yet that goes between... Uh, no, I mean there's there's programs in the area, but there's not a walk-in support specifically that I know of. But if no. a BF resident were to make it to Turning, turning Point, point absolutely. they could just walk in. Anybody, well, anybody well, can go there. And anybody. Brattleboro has Turning Point. Yep. I mean, there's, and it's, there are other There's turning, seven of them in the yeah. state of Vermont. Okay, great. Yeah. So. What are we doing to address the supply of drugs? There's two questions. There's a supply of supply of prescription drugs and then there's the supply of illegal drugs. I can say from the supply of prescription drugs, um, we as a medical field have become aware that we have created an opiate dependent population, uh, segment of the population, and we have caused them harm. We intended to help with painful conditions, but instead we have actually uh, caused opiate dependent. You can not be abusing your drug. You could be taking Percocet three times a day and using it to treat your pain, but your opiate receptors now require that medicine. Uh, and we are recognizing that, in fact, there is no evidence that says treating a painful condition that lasts more than two months with a, a opiates is actually all that effective. People don't get a benefit, pain benefit, over two months because our receptors fill up so quickly. So we're no longer considering chronic opiate therapy as effective or safe for non-cancer pain and long-term conditions, and we're prescribing it less often. We're looking for other modalities to help people with their painful conditions. So, and we've been very cognizant in our organization about whether or not we're prescribing this medicine appropriately and safely and uh, deciding to change our treatments. Um, and I think that that is happening Vermont-wide uh, and certainly countrywide as we recognize that these medicines uh, can cause real harm. Yeah, we also have a treatment agreement for controlled substances within Springfield Medical Care System that we that is a monitoring process. It means we call you for a urine, you need to come in and we're going to see what's in your urine. Uh, if you come, we ask you to come in and do a pill count, you need to come in and do a pill count with us so that we have more ability to determine and let people know way up front that they're responsible for these medications we're handing them. Because they really, we, there was a point of overprescription that meant every you know, medicine cabinet in town had you know, opiates sitting in it. Uh, you know, for a dental procedure or for, you know, you know, my, remember my wife's recent uh, procedure, almost that what it was, and, um, you know, how they sent her home with 30 tablets and she needed two, you know. So these things are still occurring, but we're trying to understand how the diversion happens and get on top of how do we 
pull things back and teach people. We go, there's a lot of trainings out there for this. And from the buprenorphine side, I mean, we are handing out this medication um, on a weekly basis most of the time. The hub will do it on a daily basis. Um, but we have these new strips with barcoding and numbers associated with it that we can kind of track. And we also, um, you know, those guys are probably, and gals are probably monitored initially better than any law enforcement person. Okay. And then <laughs> I, the, I guess the other side of the coin is... Yeah. Yeah, I suspect the question is yeah. probably more directed towards uh, what are the police doing about uh, the people mm -hmm. selling mm -hmm. drugs. I actually think that was a fair <laughs> yeah. interpretation that right. she took, mm -hmm. that it was, there is two sides of the coin. Yep. So yeah. that one, there's a gateway that's being created by, sure. um, by the yep. legal sure. drugs and it's being picked yeah. up by the... It's treatment. easier to pick a pill than it is to start with heroin. Yeah. It, there's just something that seems safer about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, what we are doing, which is we're not the only folks that do this uh, in the law enforcement community, we work aggressively with outside uh, law enforcement agencies, both in state and to this particular problem, out of state, um, and identifying those folks that are um, organized in delivering heroin to this community. We have some of those folks that live in this community. Uh, we work with members of the public in identifying them and trying to gather enough uh, evidence that is uh, it, you know, admissible into court to be able to use. Um, but some of the initiatives that uh, the chief has tasked me with, they have worked an aggressive motor vehicle enforcement program, um, a neighborhood door-to-door, -door, uh, hey, we're your local police, how can we help you? And then while we talk to them, uh, we discuss issues on a neighborhood level which then can spread out to a community level. Um, it's all about you know, making networks and making connections to know who's doing what to who and when. Um, but with that said, most of the folks that we end up arresting are not necessarily the, the individuals that are dealing it, it's the, the addicts themselves who are caught with either their own stash or caught with their own stash plus enough for somebody else to support their habit to begin with. Um, the dealers are not using themselves because mm -hmm. um, it's it's business, it's money. Yeah, and then it makes perfect sense. Um, we want to move. We want to change over um, sort of our, our direction now to looking at what can we do as a community to take action now that we sort of know what the problem is. And I have one last question for the for the uh, panel. If you had a magic wand and you could do anything. Briefly, what would you do to change where, to take an action step to change where we are? How would you solve this problem with your magic wand? My magic wand would be kids would look at a pill or heroin and not ask themselves, why not try this? I wish every child's internal voice said, no way. Uh, may seem like strange uh, comments coming from a police officer, but some of the magic wand fairy dust I wish I could spread um, was that on a socioeconomic level for this community, there was a more, it's pretty diverse as it is, um, but the gaps between the diversity and from one end to the other are too large. And there are, I wished that most of our tax base lived in this community and had a vested interest and in not just the interest in collecting the rent money. So they took care of their properties. Mm -hmm. Because when you have properties that are run down, not taken care of, those are the folks that are coming to this area. That's what they're looking for, is to not be noticed. And that's how they blend in. And, uh, I wish there was something for the kids to do more here in town. I know there are some good programs and projects, um, but there's a lot of, and maybe because of work that parents have to do, but there's a lot of kids that are unsupervised and have, uh, we deal with those issues as well. But they all are, they're all connected. Wow, magic wand. Huh? Uh, I wish it was easy. Uh, I wish when somebody wanted to stop, they were done. Um, I wish that we had uh, the capacity to say yes to everybody, whatever their needs are, uh, as quickly as we can. And I wish that um, these people would be seen 
as people with a disease. And as criminal as they are in their behavior, um, pitied. I wish that everyone was born with a boatload of genuine self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right from the beginning, everyone felt great about themselves and they didn't feel like they needed something else. Like that's not felt like one of her questions. <laughs> <laughs> the big question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for um, being willing to. do portion of this, but we want to start with, this, this is about more dreams, less drugs, and where are our dreams uh, centered there with our youth? And what we'd like to start with, um, people from youth services, lead from youth services, there are mentoring opportunities, there are things that we can do to help our kids have that self-esteem. I think that through mentoring we can do that. And I, hi, there you are. Can you just come up and just oh, speak yeah, for sure. just, a, a, just a minute? Okay. Um, so my name is Lee Madalinski. I work for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Wyndham County at Youth Services. And um, I can't help but draw a really strong connection between the issue talked about same. today and our mentoring program. What is going on? I can't on? hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, shoot the mic over there. Okay. Sorry. Right. There's technical stuff going on. Lee <laughs> Madalinski, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. <laughs> um, so I, I am a case manager. I have, um, I work with Brattleboro, Bellows Falls, and the West River Valley. I work primarily with school-based programs, and we are trying to start a new school-based program at Central Elementary School, a lunchtime program. We're looking for adults to mentor youth um, at that school, K through four, grades K through four, one hour a week during their lunch and recess time. That time, that one hour, changes can change a kid's life so much. I see it in all my clients. And a lot of my work, thankfully, is so positive because I get to go visit my clients and my, my littles and my bigs and see how they're doing and check in. And even the simple t thing of having an adult, an awesome adult, come in and tell you that you rock and eat, share a meal with you, play some games with you, and be there to talk to when something comes up is, is life-changing. There's statistics out there that say 46% um, of children who have mentors are less likely to use drugs. That's a, an impact study that Big Brothers Big Sisters has done that directly ties to this, and it, it's there. But the day-to-day -day fact is that that's not necessarily what you're talking about every day. That's the long-term results of what happens with these relationships, and it's really simple acts that can have these profound consequences down the line. Um, so I have two people who have come up to, in this all of this recruitment I've done since the fall, to mentor at this elementary school program. I know in this community of awesome people, there's more than two people <laughs> who have one hour once a week in the middle of their day to come to the school and sit with a child and hang out with them. And maybe run around crazy with a child too. <laughs> um, I'm here if you have questions about it. I have pamphlets detailing all about our program. I have pamphlets talking about our overarching program, community-based, and other things that we offer. Um, I would love to see some more folks turn up because it pulls at your heartstrings some of the things that these kids go through. I can think of one, one kid in particular that I'm working with um, who's definitely, a, a lot of our clients are affected by substance abuse, but we're not necessarily talking about it every day. But, you know, there's, there's this one kid that I'm working with and her, her father was killed because of his, his addiction and his involvement in selling drugs. And it was really tragic and she's six years old. And thankfully, three weeks before this happened, she was matched, and that, that was the first thing she wanted to talk about on her match meeting. Because there's no one to talking about at home is a loaded topic because of the tensions at home. And at school, in her first grade classroom, there's nowhere to talk about it. So someone came at lunch, and she had someone to talk to about it, who was a neutral person, who was caring and loving. And then they played games, and everything was great and normal, too. And that's really important. So that's, that's that. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, there's a few other mentorship programs that are here in the community 
And I know for the Big Brother Big Sisters program, they have had up to 31 children um, waiting for bigs. I've had kids cry and say, Deb, we need mentors to teach us conflict resolution skills. So um, if, you know, we're just really doing a call out, call out, call to action tonight. There is a sign up sheet. If you can, please, if you really care about this issue, we've got a lot of kids who really need mentors. Um, there's a few other programs that Youth Services does, and Michelle would like to take um, a moment to talk about the RAMP program. Michelle Boslin. Hi. I'll, I'll keep it super quick. So I also work for Youth Services. Uh, the RAMP program is a mentoring program which has a career development component, but we work with at-risk kids at three different high schools in Wyndham County, including here in Bellows Falls. We're actually in our fourth year in Bellows Falls. Um, at this point, we have 12 kids we're serving in Bellows Falls, and we have a, a good track record. Over the years that we've been at the school, we've had a number of kids have graduated, and some of them have even gone on to college. And most of these are kids who that hasn't been the tradition in their family. Um, the populations that we work with are, by definition, they're referred to our program because they're at risk of getting in trouble with the law, they're at risk of dropping out, they're at risk of getting pregnant, and in some cases we actually serve young mothers as well. Uh, but it, right now, our program has five mentors. Two of them are from Bellows Falls. Three of them are not from Bellows Falls. We bring them from outside because we can't get enough mentors locally. Um, and right now, we have a waiting list. We can't take any more kids in Bellows Falls unless we have some more adults. So our program meets once a week at Bellows Falls High School. Sometimes we go on field trips. Sometimes we do activities in the school. It's very much a, a relationship building activity, you know, kind of what a, Heidi was talking about helping youth build self-esteem, mm -hmm. helping them uh, build positive feelings, build trust and connections in the community, build job readiness skills so that they can go out and be able to have a more positive future. But we can't do the program without adults to serve as, as the mentors in our program. So if anybody has an interest in helping out with our program, uh, we would love to have you because we have more kids who would like to be served. And like I said, we, we can't serve any more students at the high school unless we get more people. Oh, and the requirement actually in our program is that you attend twice a month. So our program lasts for about an hour and 15 minutes once a week, but we ask as a mentor that you come in at least twice a month. So the requirement would be about two and a half hours out of your month um, to make a difference in the life of a young person while here in Bellows Falls. So hope you get in touch. Thank Thanks. You. Oh, yeah. Um, the wonderful honor of working with some amazing kids here in the community um, through the Boys and Girls Club. Um, we have an ATI group that Chad runs, um, which is Above the Influence, and they've been working on some film. And um, I get to cook with the kids once a week, and we have a blast. And I have like literally any, anywhere from 10 to 15 kids, you know, ginsu and uh, chopping and frying up. But um, these kids are really amazing, and um, the Boys and Girls Club is so special. It's the one place where they can go, where they will be accepted, wherever they're at. They don't get kicked out. Um, they uh, have built wonderful um, friendships. They work things out. Um, but um, there, there's two. Um, well, oh, oh, yeah, James, come on up here, you guys. But um, if you get a chance, um, one of the things that they've worked on with Sarah Tart here. Um, is um, a photography um, exhibit, and they got, where did you get the grant money from for that? Was that through? Um, the Wolf Con Wolf Foundation. Con Foundation. <laughs> um, but the Boys and Girls Club um, is really in need of volunteers. Um, we actually brought uh, forms on their behalf. So please, 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 please get involved. These kids are so much fun, and they're just, I, they're looking for more volunteers, right? Yeah. Yeah? So do you guys want to say anything about what you need in this community? What you'd like to see with your magic wand? Uh, <laughs> I would like, like, because some... So please, um, but this, um, this is an exhibit called Eyes of Wonder, Eyes of Hope, and the photographer is Justice Hedges. <laughs>
Sure, and before that, I'm going to um, ask a little mea culpa. Um, when this, um, at the beginning, when I did introductions, I did not introduce the staff themselves of Greater Falls Connection. So we have Chad over here. Mm -hmm. And we have coordinator. Specialist, who does a lot of focus on the faculty. So um, I'm going to go around and read these, and then as people get up and move around, the staff will be around, and we have a lot of markers. But what we want you to do is, is read the ideas, think about ideas that you might have yourself, and write them down so that we can come up with some action steps. So you have 10 minutes to get up and move so around. We've, we, so we've talked about things that we want to do, and we've added an extra one here. Sort of saying, what are your dreams? Because we always want to know what people's dreams are. Other ideas and suggestions. But as you start over here, here's some sort of more work in here, so I need to say it for more fun. So whoever wants to get involved in like spreading the word about this issue, about solutions, about things that are going on, look at what's on there, write things on there. Um, the next one we call environmental strategies. We're going to try to get an active prescription drug and opi opioid um, action team going that's working throughout the year on, on issues. So that's over there. Uh, working with law enforcement and how we can support them. We have just general projects and activities that people might like to be involved in. Over here, we've got some, some um, ideas around treatment and recovery, youth engagement, and supporting youth, like the mentoring programs. So there's ideas on there, but we want you to add yours. Um, and these are just a starting point. Okay, so take about five minutes. So and go around, add your yeah, own ideas, there, yeah, yeah. read what you think, yeah. think, think about in the back of your mind what you think the best ideas are. Uh, 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 Let's play your object while we back to the cheese and uh, okay. stuff. <laughs> All right, Lee, yes. can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Because I forgot your last name already. Lee, yeah. My name is Lee Madalinski, and I'm a case manager for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Wyndham County at Youth Services. And you're trying to recruit mentors for the Bellows Falls? Yes, I'm recruiting mentors for a school-based lunchtime program at Central Elementary School. So the people that have to come for like, how long, they just come in and have lunch? Yeah, they just come for one hour during the child's lunch and recess time, and you can share a meal with them, you can play games with them, you can work on an art project, you can go outside for recess. It just depends on, on you and the child and what flows well with your match. Okay, great. Yeah. And how would people get in contact with you in order to be able to, yeah. to join in? They can call me at youth services at my office, 802-257-0361, and ask for Lee or just ask for Big Brothers Big Sisters. Or if you Google youth services, Brattleboro, you're going to find all that yeah. information, right? You're going to find all that information. Okay, great. So either call that number or Google it. Great. This
So we had people write down um, their ideas in the last five minutes. Now we're going to go around. We're going to start with Chad, and he's going to read. Um, let's start with what you dream. We'll start with Ash. We'll end with this one. We're going to end with what you dream. Yeah. So we'll start here and go around, and then we'll end with this one. And you guys are going to really have to speak up and report people. So what we're all going to do is we're each going to read everyone's ideas. And we know this might take a couple of minutes, but this will just be so we all know what the ideas are. And then Mike, after we all read each one, Mike will then kind of explain the next part of the exercise. And I think it's going to be really exciting what we're going to end with. So what we have are other ideas and suggestions. So we have then volunteers would be evaluated to find a suitable, a suitable way that they can help out appropriately. Um, and many may want to help but not find a certain fit. So what I'll say for this one is United Way just started a new, um, a new option for folks in the community called Volunteer Your Time. Volunteer Connections. Volunteer Connections. Thank you. Um, so Volunteer Connections is a way to match organizations that do no, no. social service work in the community or well, volunteers that want to do volunteer work. So I encourage people yeah. to respond to volunteer. United Way of Indian Camp. United Way of Indian Camp. Mm -hmm. So the next one is supporting youth. There's a lot of ideas right here. So the first one, what? So the first one is volunteer with Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, we already talked about that. Um, youth Services Young Moms Group, so supporting the Young Moms Group there. A Young Dads Group, Early Ed Services. Central Elementary Lunch Mentorship Program, and that's, these are the same thing. Uh, Boys and Girls Club, so helping the volunteering there. Become a foster parent or a respite provider. And somebody who wrote, who wrote that down want to explain I, what that is? I, I did. Um, I'm actually here as a parent, but um, there's a there's because of what I'm hearing is because of the, the opiate um, addiction problem. There's a lot more kids that are coming into custody, and kids need support. And there's a huge, huge shortage of people who are willing and able to bring these kids into their home and provide them with a safe, stable place to be. And many of these kids have not experienced that and need that opportunity. So I know that Department of Children and Families is, you know, desperately recruiting. I, I, I get through my job, I get calls from them. We just had four kids come into custody today. We have nowhere to put them, you know, that sort of thing. So I know that they're desperate for that. And then, you know, we're just looking also, HCRS has a respite program for kids that are in need or at risk that just need another safe place to go overnight. Thank so you. it's a huge thing to ask of people. No, thank you. Yeah. Um, to check judgments and inter in, in, interact with you with an open heart. Um, so I think that, that one's something that we can all do on a daily basis. Um, and then connect uh, retirees with youth. So having that multi-generational connection. So following that, we've got youth engagement, ways to get more involved. And these sort of cross over and, and connect with one another. But for many of you who don't know that the leadership group at Bellas Falls Middle School is going to be putting on a community health day. So um, they may be reaching out to various people in the community to help, and they're going to need volunteers and stuff. And they're going to do a big event downtown on May 17th. May 17th. Volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club. Help find um, arts opportunities for kids, like this great photo. Um, exhibit that Boys and Girls Club is doing and letting kids sort of try out new and interesting ways to sort of explore their, their, their creativity um, or coordinating a poetry slam with kids in the community, things like that. Expose kids to options, education and employment. Um, and help kids find their passion, their interests, their skills by doing things like sort of these um, uh, creativity programs that allow them to explore new things. Um, <coughs> treatment and recovery. Organize events, um, working with like organizations like ours or Phoenix House with HCRS with Turning Point um, during National Recovery Month this is in September to help raise awareness about what recovery is and uh, what kind of services and supports out there. 
volunteer to help compile information on treatment resources and recovery resources so that everybody in the community can have something and know sort of when somebody calls or somebody talks to somebody, where can they go? What are those walk-in hours at ACRS? What does Turning Point do? What is peer recovery? I'm a certified Vermont recovery coach. Um, work with the restorative justice program, which is based in hot place here in Little Falls. Advocate um, at the state level um, and at the federal level for more funding for recovery programs. Improve how we share treatment information. 211 hotline, which gets back to this compiling information. Work with local businesses to reduce negative stigma about people. Learn to support and embrace. Alrighty, over here we have projects and activities. Um, we need people to get involved in um, our um, prescription drug take back day, which is actually this Saturday. It happens um, twice a year. We always could use volunteers for that to help promote the event. Um, we would love to get some signs up at the dump or maybe some permanent signs at the senior center because the um, pill drop box is there every single day. Um, reaching out to the medical community so we can learn about the Vermont per, um, prescription drug monitoring um, system to see how that's working. Um, another project coming up is the Kern Hatton Spring Fling. We're looking for volunteers for that. And uh, this is our very own kid generated annual celebration, which is Parka Palooza. Um, we would love, yeah, look at those Parka Palooza kids down there, yeah. Um, this is, a, this um, is now an annual celebration that we have right in the School Street um, playground. And it is the most amazing thing um, because the kids are totally unplugged and it's just old school games. Um, parents come and we have a whole big barbecue. And um, last year the um, PD came and the uh, fire department came and they opened up the hydrant, and we had a blast. Um, and also, we have art exhibits. Um, the great thing about art is it tells a story, and it's also an opportunity to um, get those voices out in our community. Um, next, law enforcement. Woohoo! Go Shane! <laughs> We've got a Neighborhood Watch, volunteers to organize Neighborhood Watch, use and promote the tip line, promote BFPD uh, prescription drug, bo drug box. Sorry about that. Um, work with law enforcement um, to develop projects. And one thing um, in particular that they're going to be doing that we would love to see everyone get involved in is a t-shirt project, which I'm not going to speak to. Shane, would you just mention exactly what this is going to be? Well, what, what we're hoping to do is... Can you louder? I'm sorry. What we're hoping to do is a, uh, collect a group of t-shirts um, categorized by color in terms of um, people affected by heroin use, people that have, you know, then the collateral uh, damage associated with that, either be families or whatnot, and then have volunteers wear those shirts in and around the community on one day with information to be able to speak to what the color of that shirt particularly means, but to involve the businesses and just general people so it's in your face, you, it's be hard to avoid. All right. Uh, okay, there's, one more. there's, there's two more. Uh, last two over here. Um, uh, this one is environmental strategy, so that's looking at the community-wide kind of systems and policy that we can work on together um, within our community to create environments um, that are healthy and uh, promote wellness. Um, the one is to join the prescription drug action team um, that uh, Great Falls Connections uh, facilitates. Um, the other is the Lack Your Meds campaign. Um, can somebody speak to that? Yep, so that's essentially uh, promoting secure, safely securing your medicine, uh, your prescription drugs at home. So finding ways to either lock them or uh, find ways to make sure that you're keeping count and keeping them away from our children. Um, so promoting those activities. And keeping them out of the environment. Mm -hmm. Because say, uh, prop, it's not just keeping them safe, it's also proper disposal mm -hmm. and where block boxes, permanent drop boxes are in our uh, community. Yeah. And I'm just going to say one thing 70% of um, kids report getting their prescription drugs 
from home, from families and friends. So it's not necessarily the drug dealer in the corner. This is one of the most simplest things we can do is monitor, count, and secure our events. Okay, so the other ones are coordinate and assist with event planning, things like this, things like community events, um, to, to help uh, spread the word and to uh, facilitate the collaboration. And then uh, the last is procure funding for locks boxes for minutes. So again, we do have permanent drop boxes in our community at the Bells Falls Police Department uh, and during their working hours during the week. And also a uh, 24-hour box in Brattleboro. There's one in Springfield. And the brochure has information about all the lock boxes in our area. The lock boxes could also be in the home. So pr procuring funding for lock boxes in our home. They're much smaller. Um, so, you know, something like that. Um, promoting it, you know, within the community and individuals. So our last one is spread the word. And I think this is something that all of us can do and all of us uh, coming out of this have handed. Um, whether it's uh, with your friends, with your uh, family, with the community groups that you're a part of. Um, this is something that we all can do. It's spread the word. Share, the, share uh, word of mouth hanging posters at your workplace. We have some of those back here about um, about prescription drugs and the prescription drug locations, uh, drop box locations. Sharing info at any groups that you're a part of or know uh, about Rotary Clubs, Women's Clubs, the Moose, all those animal clubs, MTO, <laughs> Paris groups, um, and spreading info on Green Up Day and having just you know, more uh, meetings that can promote all this uh, information and what we're doing in our community to um, to address this issue. And then somebody, maybe uh, Mike wrote this, is volunteered to do a PSA. <laughs> and what is a PSA? It's a public service announcement. So it's a great way to spread the word and it's easy to do and it takes about five minutes and you can come to Fact TV and Joe will film you and We'll have a great time. And we would love to give you resources for that if you uh, wanted to do something for It is fun. All right, are we going to do three? Oh, yes, three. Of course. <laughs> Why not? Um, so the final one is what are your dreams? And so um, the first one we have is jobs that are local with health insurance and full time. Um, and this came up in the panel discussion too. Um, and I should, uh, you know what, I'll make a brief note here that we are, we've been doing a series of workshops uh, at Greater Falls Connections, uh, uh, looking at some of the deeper issues uh, at, at poverty and how poverty impacts uh, substance abuse, uh, the jo lack of jobs, transportation, some of the structural issues. So if you have questions about that or would like to talk more about those implications around substance abuse and addiction, please uh, come up to us afterwards and let us know. Um, paid maternity leave, affordable child care um, and cooperative, uh, free pre-k, uh, free pre-k, pre pre totally free, so early childhood, um, uh, prenatal care for pregnant women and girls, especially during addicted mom for for addicted moms, um, less prejudice towards people in recovery. More art, less drugs. <laughs> An end to drug addiction um, and all the pain that goes with it in more organized activities. So these are our dreams. These are, these, are, I, these are really powerful. Thank you all for putting those down. Thank you. Now the final step is everybody should find a little strip of stickers that they they were uh, uh, like the ones on this Hi. <laughs> we have more. But we have more. Who needs stickers? You can wear them on your face. You can wear them on your face. But what we wanted to do was use them as provoking. So, all right, everyone, listen up just for one minute. All right, so we want you to take your stickers. You should have five stickers. If you don't have five stickers, we have people that will give you five stickers. And go around and put your stickers on the five ideas you like the most. If there's one idea that you just love all out, you can put all five stickers there. But you, you get the ideas. You get to distribute your votes over the five ideas that you like. We will pick the best five of the five ideas. And we, we're actually uh, on the agenda for the select board next Tuesday. And these um, ideas will be presented to the select board. So this is, like we said, we're trying to get the, the community involved. So this is the first step for doing that. We want to identify projects and priorities. 
So it's up to you to vote on these now. So take a few minutes and do that. And then, and I guess I would just add, like just because it doesn't get the top vote doesn't mean we're not going to continue to look at it and have it incorporated into some of the other things that we're doing. Oh. So if you could just take a few minutes, we're almost at the end. No, 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 Six, we're looking for people to put their name next to one of them um, and say, I'll take the lead on doing that. Obviously, with our support, uh, Greater Falls Connections will use um, everything that we have at our disposal to support these efforts. But what we're looking for is in with these top six vote getters, we're looking for people or an organization to say, I'll take the lead on uh, making sure this happens or finding the support to make this happen. Yeah. I just want to say the role that we play um, it speaks volumes in our name, which is Greater Falls Connections. This is pretty big. Yeah. Again, yeah. pretty big, right? Right. Well, guess what? There are a ton of people in this community who are working really, really hard on workforce development. Up at the high school now, they actually hired uh, Missy Wilkins to um, develop personal learning plans for every student starting in, from middle school up into the high school that will actually get them to start thinking and having skills um, so that they can ha um, think about um, future employment, whether it means going to college or learning um, a trade. 
um, or getting a certification. There are a ton of people working yeah, what on that. What happened to the guidance of the council? Don't they have guidance counselors? They have lots of uh, support up there. What they don't have is the community support. And <laughs> they can't, the people who are dreaming about the <laughs> job force development need you with all your resources and connections. They need the social capital. No more money. We don't want to throw money at this stuff. We need, we need you. We need you to step into us and dream and imagine. You know who the employers are. You know. So for this one, for instance, if an organization or an individual wanted to take that on, it is a big one. It's, and a big one. it's not going to be solved overnight. But there are, like as Deb was saying, there are organizations that are focused on the southern seven, the southeastern Vermont development strategies, economic development strategies, is looking at wind and tide, uh, wind and wind wind and county wide, um, <laughs> wind and county wide uh, effort to improve our economy. And so if folks are interested in making those connections with the work that we're trying to do, um, put your name up or volunteer uh, that your organization will make some of those connections. And a lot of it for us is also making sure that we all know, I mean, everybody that's in this group, everybody that visits our website or our Facebook page or other groups knows what's going on around these things in the community. Mm -hmm. Amelia and I, and I think Christine, still here, yeah are part of a leadership group of, of a group called Ready by 21 that's doing similar kind of work to really make sure that the kids in this community are ready for work, life, college, adulthood um, by the time they're 21. So, um, I mean, there's other groups out there that are also sort of coming at things maybe in a slightly different way that people can get involved in or support or refer people to. So there is a lot of good things going on. Um, sometimes it's all happening in these little silos. Mm -hmm. Some of what we're trying to do is, is break down some of those silos and, and get more information shared. So how about, we'll, we'll take the first one. Mm -hmm. all right. Greater Falls Connections is going to volunteer to be the lead group on Park of Yes! As we have. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, that means we're going to ask a lot of help to do that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're going to put our names by right here. <laughs> So, so as how about this project, the T-shirt project? The, all right. Please mm -hmm. confirm it. Who's willing to work with Shane on this project? Yeah. Come on. Sarah. Oh, all right. Oh, we got a volunteer back there. Woo-hoo. All right, Tim. I'm the boss. Tim. I'll work on it. Jim Walsh. Soul Souls Village Corporation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. What's the All right. Board? And uh, Jim Reese, the select okay. board. This is for the, the, the teacher project? You bet. Yeah, Rockingham Select Board. Yeah. Rockingham Select Board will take jobs that are local. I didn't get a t shirt. Either. I'm watching to see what. It's Chip. There's already activity going on there. Um, interesting. Chroma Technologies mm -hmm. and Sonics have already done studies. Um, Southerns has uh, looked into the top 25 employers in Union County, in Bennington County. And there are well over 200 jobs in the next five years in which people will be leaving, and a skill set is needed to replace them. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is our education system mm -hmm. placing people there mm -hmm. that have the skill sets for the jobs mm -hmm. and are not? your tiny time an hour and we're trying to match and in fact mm -hmm. have active uh, corporate leaders from those two companies mm -hmm. that are coordinating with the schools to say this is the skill set that needs to be developed find people interested in the skill set and right out of high school <coughs> I can begin to use them so that exists and uh, is going to change over the next five years and will continue to grow and this, this is an analysis they do every year, looking to the next five years. Mm -hmm. So this is well underway, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I recently, you. you know, sold a job, and kids would come in, mm -hmm. you know, fill out a job application, they could barely, since fill it out in pencil, they obviously fill it out in ink or some other. Mm -hmm. but they would come in with a variety of tattoos. Mm -hmm. And if the job opening was receptionist, you mm -hmm. know, you didn't want a neck tattoo. tattoo. Mm -hmm. So, who teaches them these things that this is not appropriate if you're going out for a job? 
Um, well, I think um, Missy Wilkins up at the um, up at the WNESU is working on interviewing skills, <coughs> resume building. Um, you know what's appropriate for a job interview, what's not. Um, there's you know other ways to handle that. I know there's. Um, Different degrees now of acceptance of uh, tattoos. They're not, not quite so stigmatized as they used to be. I personally don't have any myself, but that's my personal choice. Um, but uh, some people you know, consider it artistic expression, but that's what Missy's doing. Um, and she's also you know, connecting with the employers and finding out what are the skill sets that are going to be needed. I think that's real, a wonderful move on behalf of um, the district. I mean, they can have tattoos. My son has tattoos. Yes. He no, but appropriate. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to wear, yeah. you know, there's you know, there certain one clothes that, that you want to wear when you go, yeah. you know, to a job <laughs> interview or a professional skill, <laughs> and she'll be working with them on their personalized. Um, okay. So, how about yeah. somebody else? Yeah. Thank you to the select yeah. board so for okay. stepping up on that one. It's a big one. So there's it's also a, a, a weekly or monthly job club that meets at a oh, park's yeah. place yeah. that is are for people who are out of school who um, are hoping to learn skills. more skills, uh, either direct skills, but also just interview skills, resume writing, how to look for jobs. It's, all it's weekly on Wednesdays from what? 10 to 11. No, what is ramp? It's weekly at Parks Place on Wednesdays from 10 to 11. So we've got um, a lot of numbers right here, people supporting the um, volunteer for the Big Brothers Big Sisters. I'll take that. <laughs> she'll take the lead I'll leave that. that. Yeah. And she did it. She was so well prepared that she has a sign-in sheet. So uh, people uh, who there's uh, a lot of stickers and one name. Yeah. Um, so um, feel free to put your name down, even if you just want to, you know, talk about different levels of being a big um, and, yeah. and and what it means. It's not a commitment. It's a conversation. Exactly. So please sign up for a nice conversation. <laughs> we have some lovely packets here you can take home and start the process. All right, so we've got two more left that haven't been assigned. More, more art, less drugs. Whoa, <laughs> hand, look at the hands go up. All right. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, that's awesome. Woo! So we've got Shane. We've got Heidi. We've got Allison. All right. We've got um, Robert. 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 Yeah. Robert. 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 James. Good to meet you, Robert. James. Thank you. Justice. Sarah. Justice. James. Luna. James. Sarah. You won't tell me. Thank you. Um, and we're gonna be, I, I think this summer is going to be a good summer for some artwork this, this year. I'm mm -hmm. excited about that. So what, one more? Um, help kids find their passion, their interest in school, a skill. That's a tough one. Yeah. 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 We're still fight trying to find that out as adults. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, 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 I have a 16-year-old who is absolutely clear and focused on my dream. Okay. Yep. So, we're talking. Now I think she's pretty sad. Um, but I mean, I think this is something that can be also worked into a lot of this other stuff as you're doing art projects, as you're doing planning events, as you're talking about jobs, can we job skills. mix that with the art one? Can we make that part of the art sure. one somehow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just yeah, but it also be mixed in with the, uh, the, the guidance the counselors at the school, but... The pigs. And the brothers, and brothers big sisters, mentoring. Yeah, I mean, yeah that's definitely yeah, part of mentoring. That's going to combine a lot. Is the school should be asking the kids what they want to become. And if the guidance counselors are not guiding them into the right area... It's something that we could all... all but yes, some people don't know what they want to be and they'll have to make it out of school. But how do we help them find out what they're good at? Which will have what they need. Well, um, I've mentored a lot of yeah. artists and designers over the year that have known they loved art and sketching and what have you, but have no idea how to apply that to a career in the future so a great way to do that is to help teaching them design skills and computer skills and how to prepare their art pieces to be produced and what it takes to do a gallery show versus uh, get a job in a marketing or advertising agency versus illustrating t-shirts. Yeah. 
And I, th I think we've had some local artists in town do that just recently. Charlie Hunter, uh, yep. if I'm not mistaken, just led a, a workshop on how to make a living as an artist. Yep. And because that's oftentimes in Vermont, you know, a lot of us cobble together work. And so sometimes we don't know how to make a living off of things that we're really interested in doing. I do want to give some kudos to the high school because they just put on their second annual career fair. And they had a lot of local employers, mm -hmm. colleges, they had VSAC there. We were there, police, law enforcement were there, Chroma was there, um, and somebody from AHEC, which mm -hmm. is the Area Health Education. Oh, yeah. There's also a lot of them. Anyway, they're based out of Springfield, but they cover Southern Vermont. But their big focus is on helping people find uh, careers in the medical field. Mm -hmm. And so she had all kinds of information out there. Like, do you know how many Where careers are in the medical field? So it's like, it's not like do I want to be a doctor or a nurse. It's going to put some care coordinates. There's like over 300 jobs for about an hour of it. in the medical field that people can do. Uh, so helping people sort of Join take that, that you know, to the deeper yeah, mm -hmm. level. Yeah. So he feels comfortable doing it. Well, I think it's just a drop this. Okay, so we've got top, top five then with names like this one. We've got top five. You're going to report those to the select board on Tuesday. Yep. Same I want to thank the panel again for coming and for Spend your evening uh, really contributing to the community because this is a community um, crisis and this be a community solution that will so that's the only thing we'll fix it. We can't do this individually. And I hope, although spreading the word didn't get a lot of votes, I think it's important that we spread the word because and you can, um, if you want, you can make we have a group here that's pretty heavy on the topic to solve the problem. Yeah. So really spread the word. Thank you all. Thank you. I'd like to thank Mike for being our moderator. Thank you very much.